wanted to be part of the world, but I didn't see anyone like me in it. I hear about a summer camp for the handicapped run by hippies. Somebody said you probably will smoke dope with the counselors, and I'm like, sign me up. Have to catch an edit and find yourself. There I was. I was in Woodstock. You wouldn't be picked to be on the team back home, but at Jeanette, you had to go up the back. Even when we were that young, we helped empower each other. It was allowing us to recognize that the status quo is not what it needed to be. The world always wants us dead. We live with that reality. At the time, so many kids just like me were being sent to institutions. It was just a continual struggle. Most disabled people, like myself, are unable to use public transportation. We needed a civil rights law of our own. Hello, I'm Anne Hornaday, the Washington Post's chief film critic. Welcome to Washington Post Live and welcome to our Oscar Spotlight series. We are highlighting the five films nominated for Academy Awards for Best Documentary Feature. And today I'm speaking with Nicole Noonan and Jim Lebrecht, co-directors of Crip Camp, The Disability Revolution, a fascinating film and one of those nominees. Um, to give a little additional context for our listening audience today, I wanted to let you know I'm wearing a blue sweater, uh, smudged glasses, and I have a small plant to, uh, to my left. Um, Nicole, Jim, thank you both so much for joining us, and congratulations on the nomination. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's great to be here. Um, Crip Camp, as you could probably d discern from that from that clip, tells this incredible story of uh, this amazing camp that we meet in the 1970s. It's older than that. We'll get into the history a little bit. But the story of this group of people who went to this camp in the 70s and how that community blossomed into what we know of as the disability rights movement. Nicole, you've been making nonfiction films for 25 years. You, of course, you made The Rape of Europa about the theft and uh, destruction of European works of art during World War II. You've made a film about children in Calcutta seizing their own futures. What drew you to the disability rights movement or did it draw you? <laughs> kind of both, you know, I mean, I had been, um colleagues with Jim for 15 years and friends. And, um, and over that time, Jim had really opened up this sort of portal for me into disability uh, and a way of looking at disability that I hadn't before known. I saw it as a culture, as a community. Jim, I would come in to mix a film with Jim. Uh, he's a you know, brilliant sound mixer in the Bay Area and all the documentary filmmakers here, you know, cherish the time when we get to bring our films into his studio. And he would be, you know, playing, um, you know, an album by a disabled rapper. And he would be talking to me about his struggle to um, to get access to, say, the Filmmakers Lodge at the Sundance Festival, which used to be up, you know, several flights of stairs. And I was really fascinated by this more uh, rights-based way of looking at disability. Um, so then I got lucky enough one day for, that Jim decided to pitch me on um you know, trying to make films about disability from that point of view and films that would authentically really experience. And he pitched me the idea of a film about his summer camp. Um, and I kind of rolled my eyes because it sounded sort of like a cute idea and like that kind of thing that people, people always feel their summer camp was special, you know. And then he sent me some pictures of Camp Jeanette and I literally almost fell out of my chair because I realized that Jeanette was this utopia, as Jim described it, that, you know, was the kind of thing that most of us have never even known existed, and it still doesn't exist today, you know? Um, so the fact that he was saying, this may be connected to the civil rights movement, this profound experience of liberation that I and, and my friends had, um, was really intriguing. And rather than me take on the project, I said to Jim, why don't we direct this together so the story can be told from your point of view? And we set about trying to figure out how. Brilliant. And 
liberation is exactly the word. This, the, the imagery, the sheer wealth of images um, that you had to work with, I thought was just breathtaking. I want our audience to see a clip sooner rather than later because in order to get to that sense of joy and, and immense freedom that, that, that Camp Jeanette um, offered to its campers is, is really contagious. Let's play a clip that, that kind of gets to how magical this place was. And then, Jim, I'd like to circle back with you. Let's watch. Oh, Past camper and Capolo Freeman. I mean, when Woodstock was happening, I remember being at my grandmother's listening on the transistor radio and saying, wish I could go, wish I could go, wish I could go. And then when I went to Jeanette, it was like, and there I was, I was in Woodstock. The music and the people. And just feel like, these people are crazy, you know? I mean, in a good way. A girl at camp. Come to Camp Jeanette and find yourself, you know? <laughs> a boy slides out of his wheelchair into a pool. Then he dives underwater amid other swimmers and those floating in life jackets. Past camper Denise Jacobson recounts. <laughs> Subtitles read, it was so funky. But it was a utopia. When we were there, there was no outside world. A black and white camp photo shows Denise as an 18-year-old beaming at the camera from her wheelchair. You know, it's stunning to think that this was a camp that was founded as far back as 1951. Jim, could you give us a little history of Camp Jeanette and the ethos behind what, as um, one of the campers described, what became a utopia? Yeah, the camp uh, back then was started by um, two sisters. Um, and there was just kind of a history of trying to have a camp that was a, a, a bit different, a bit more open, a bit less restrictive. And certainly when I got there in the early 70s, indeed it was, uh, truly was what what Denise says, a, a utopia. I, I, I had a sense of freedom there uh, and acceptance and joy that I rarely ever had outside of that camp. I can't imagine actually that I, I really, really, really did. And, but it was a product of its time. It was the early 70s. We were questioning everything, all these different liberation movements. And, um, you know, why not us? Right. And, it, you know, I think one of the most um, profound things that this film advances is this the importance of community and social space, right? I mean, I think that... So many, you know, one of the definitions of privilege is that you claim social, you know, social space is yours for the taking. It's not even questioned. And um, this movie just shows us in such concrete ways how um, having a social space that you can claim for your own is just absolutely essential in terms of personal development and political development. One of the campers there happened to be Judy Human, of course, who's now very well known um, as a disability rights activist. Um, and one thing, the other thing that, she, something she points out, but that this film expresses beautifully is the organic intersectionality of the disability rights movement. Um, of, to use a term that we would use today, but maybe not so much then. But Nicole, how do you how critical do you think intersectionality was to the success of the disability rights movement? I mean, what we found was that it was completely essential. Like the the you know the most striking example of that in the film, which is is actually literal, is that the Black Panthers delivered food to the organizers. You know who were um, who were sitting in this federal building. You know for um, about a month, um, every single day, three hot meals a day. And um, and they could not have sustained their protest and pushed forward, you know, one the implementation of the first really significant disability civil rights legislation in this country had that food not been delivered. But not only that, folks from the LGBTQ movement, folks from the women's movement, um, all these different people who had members who were in the building of their own communities, because disability is by its very nature intersectional. 
um, were contributing to the success of this. And I think that we felt that that was a really valuable lesson for the particular time that we find ourselves in. And, you know, as the pandemic happened and then, you know, we saw the upswell of the Black Lives Matter movement this summer, um, it seemed, you know, like sort of striking that this story from 1977 was kind of meeting our moment of today in such a powerful way. But we really felt like that was true, that you can see the, the seeds of this kind of community across difference that's created at the camp and then how that very philosophy and kind of um, you know, way of, of being became the kind of, you know, uh, secret weapon or, or really power that, um, that uh, provoked political change down the road. That's fascinating. Um, the protest that you're alluding to was this incredible occupation of a federal building in San Francisco, which lasted for 25 days, 150 activists occupied the building. I think it's still to this day the longest occupation of a federal building, um, of the, a, a sit-in at a federal building. I want to play a, a clip and then come back to Jim, who was who was there, who was actually a participant. But let's watch um, a clip that shows how that protest began. Blind African American activist Dennis Phillips recounts. I was asked to go to the demonstration by my sister, and I said, "Okay." I'll give it a shot. And then all of a sudden, someone said, well, let's go in the building. You know, what are we going to do, stand outside? So I headed toward the building. Holland. The speeches were over, and I followed this group of people into the building. There must have been 300 people. And they went up to the fourth floor, and they went into the office of the regional director. Now, what's he going to do with all these people in wheelchairs? Judy sits with Health, Education, and Welfare Regional Director Joseph Maldonado. We are not asking you anything unreasonable. We are asking you to request a telephone call to talk to Joseph Califano. Mr. Labasi, the General Counsel for HEW, has been designated as a person that I should discuss these matters with. And if you care The more I sat in this room and got these absolutely non-answers, the angrier I got, and that's when people started really feeling like we couldn't leave because... No one knew what we were talking about, but we knew that they were trying to rescind the regulation. Dennis recounts. Five or six o'clock came and nobody was leaving. So I figured, okay, we're we gonna have to spend the night. <laughs> so Jim, put us in the room. You were there at, at that protest. Tell us how it all began and what it was what your memories are from that time. Well, I really wish I could say I was there, but actually I, oh. I wasn't. I was in college in San Diego, kind of blithely not knowing that this was happening. But I must tell you that I learned so much about this particular event by the work that we did on our film and, and to talk to Dennis Phillips and to talk to uh, Corbett O'Toole and to really hear what their experiences were. And, of course, Judy and uh, uh, other folks, I... I wish I had been there. Well, you know, that brings up a really good, one of my questions is which is just this wealth of footage that you had to work with. How did Jim, how did you assemble um, these images? I, I am so gratified and grateful of all the, for all the home movies that were taken at Camp Jeanette. Um, those are really special, but then you have all of this fabulous footage from other events. Can you tell us a little bit about that journey? Uh, certainly. I mean, when we first started out, um, we did not know that that black and white video footage from Camp Jeanette existed. And it, uh, I had this memory of this group of hippie videographers showing up at camp. And then, in fact, one day they handed me the camera and I, I did a tour of the camp. Um, with a little bit of information, Nicole set out to try to see if we could figure out who these people were. And, you know, lo and behold, after three months of searching, Nicole found uh, in the back of a digitized magazine for video makers at the time uh, an advertisement for a videotape of the crab epidemic at Camp Jeanette for the handicapped by the People's Video Theater. And at that point, we had a, na a name of an organization. Uh, we found that one of them, Howard Gutstadt, uh, just lived across the bay in San Francisco. Um, and we um, wound up being able to uh, leave a message for him. He was a board member at a anarchist bookstore in San Francisco, which is 
all make sense to me. And uh, and I we both remember this day where we got this email, and he said, "Yeah, we have this footage, and we've got five and a half hours of it." And uh, that was extraordinary. I mean, um, the other, especially the footage from the sit-in, uh, is really due to all of us digging around, finding things. We had some incredible archival um, uh, research people, and uh, but we all dug in to really try to find uh, this footage. M- much of it uh, was very hard to find, and we, and as you can kind of see, we had to piece together. Mm. Oh, well, and you know, you remind me when we were, we were looking at the Crip Camp poster waiting for this session to start. And I think it, it has the distinction of being rated R, to which you're, you're uh, the, the crab epidemic, the great crab epidemic of whatever <laughs> year it was. Now, Tess, you guys, <laughs> it's a real ba- it's a badge of courage, sir. Um, <laughs> Nicole, this documentary is, is a production of Higher Ground, of course, which is Barack Obama and Michelle Obama's production company with Netflix. Um, and I understand this was one of the first projects that they signed on for. Can you tell us a little bit about their involvement? Yeah, I think it actually was the first. Um, it was incredible, actually. So we have this executive producer, Howard Gertler, and he uh, read in the trades that the Obamas were starting a production company um, in partnership with Netflix. And he immediately thought, because we were really early on in our process, we had the story mapped out and we had a fundraising trailer and we were finding footage and starting to assemble it. You know, he thought this could be perfect for them because of the sort of shared values between the Obamas and, you know, our our project, this idea of the importance of grassroots organizing, the capacity for young people to change the world, you know, um, the idea that this is elevating a story from a marginalized community that needs to be told. And even that idea of kind of like becoming and telling your own story, um, all of those things are embodied in our project. So we made an effort to get our uh, fundraising trailer in front of Priya Swami Nathan, who had just been hired to run Higher Ground. She called us up and said, I don't know what you guys did, but I cannot stop watching this thing. And my bosses feel the same way. So eventually, um, you know, they said they wanted to roll up their sleeves and partner with us. And it has really been an incredibly rewarding partnership and that they were, you know, fully engaged in the process, incredibly supportive of our vision, um, gave us a lot of artistic leeway, but actually also gave us a lot of advice. And, um, you know, uh, President Obama and Mrs. Obama themselves watched, you know, three cuts of our film and gave feedback. And, um, you know, we, we actually like, I don't think that we've still um, fully internalized that this is actually happening or has happened, but it's been an incredible platform um, from which to kind of, you know, uh, tell this story, which is such an important, important American story. I think one of the great civil rights stories of our history, but that for so long has remained relatively unknown. You know, I was going to say the same thing. This is a buried history. And it's so interesting to me that it's it's at the Oscars this year, alongside movies like Trial of Chicago 7 and Judas and the Black Messiah, mm-hmm. that also get, especially Judas and the Black Messiah, gets to that same intersectionality that Fred Hampton was practicing um, before his life was ended prematurely. So it's just, it's fascinating to me that we sort of get what we need in this kind of generational way sometimes from the culture. Um, And like you said earlier, who would have known that these would have been, you know, brought to us in the year of pandemic and the, in the year of um, protests on behalf of black lives. So I hope that, the viewers will take these these lessons to heart. I, I must ask though, both Michelle Obama and Barack Obama are such gifted storytellers in their own right. Can you share some of their notes to you? I mean, do you remember any specific um, feedback or advice that they gave? I'd be fascinated to hear that. I think that they were they were really um, interested in sort of like the, um, the, the President Obama himself was really interested in in the process of how did the how did the actual uh, legislation come about, you know, and had it was very hard for us to figure out how to tell this really complicated kind of story about how does a movement push legislation forward um, in a way that was really digestible, but also really historically accurate. So insightful questions that kind of got us to the place of being able to do that effectively. And also just like lots of really thought provoking questions about kind of um, you know, the, the camp itself and what was the philosophy of the camp? You know, I think we had 
we had at one point thought that we didn't need to have the camp director's voice necessarily in the camp kind of laying out the camp philosophy. And, um, you know, he, we, we actually, you know, Larry Allison, who started the camp is not alive anymore. So it seemed almost impossible. And it was this kind of like gentle questioning that kind of pushed us to figure out, you know, some way to do it. And we ended up being able to use this old audio recording and, um, and splice together, <laughs> you know, it was, it was like a, just like an editing feat that kind of, you know, if, if President Obama wants it, then we we will make it happen, you know? Um, and so I'm so grateful that we actually figured out some way to have Larry's voice. It, it works beautifully. So Jim, this is in many ways your life story. I mean, it really does tr chronicle your your development from a little boy to, to the gifted sound designer that you are today. So you are both, you're a character in this film and you're the co-director. So was the was that ever awkward for you or uh thread us through that journey for you well f first off you know i was uh uh surprised but incredibly happy that nicole asked me to co-direct co-produce the film with her um and um you know it's really it, it, I, I i think that it worked because we had this incredible um collaboration we had known each other for a long time, but there was a lot of trust, and I had to put on different hats at time and, and kind of just dig in and and really try not to filter myself as I was trying to relate stories and such. But there was this trust that that I could say anything, and that if I felt like I there was something that made me very uncomfortable, that I, you know, we we would talk about it. So I. Uh, you know, the trust and support of everybody um, really made a big difference. Yeah, and I would imagine too, another thing I really admire about this, and I, and I, would, I would assume, but you tell me, um, that one of the challenges is tone, you know, because it, this is definitely an inspiring story, but I even think somebody in the film uses the term ins inspiring or inspiration porn. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to teeter into being patronizing. Um, or condescending, and and so, can you tell us a little bit about those conversations? Well, I mean, you you know, the, the title itself is something <laughs> that we you know we chose Crip Camp. Oh my gosh, you're using the you know the the c word, and in reality, it was a way for us very quickly to kind of say, look, this is not your average. Ah, oh, what an incredible, inspiring story. This is a story about a people and a culture and a, and a movement. And that, you know, for me, as somebody with a disability, not everybody likes this term, but for me, it represents the fact that I identify culturally as somebody with a disability and politically. And, and it is words that I, you know, I've heard. I remember Corbett, who you see in the film, saying to me, hey, Jim, did you go to Crip Camp? And it was like, it, it was the first time I kind of heard somebody use it in that uh, in that way, and I went, oh, 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 yeah, but of course. And you know, when my wife Sarah, who's one of our producers, and I were driving around, and I, I go, uh, let's go up one more block because there's a crib spot on the right side up ahead. That's a handicapped parking spot. I, I want to just add that you know this issue that you raised it was probably the most um, important thing for us to get right in the film. And we, we kind of ended up talking about how there were like these two sort of tractor ruts that people's brains go into around disability. And one of them is the inspiring thing and the other is the tragic thing. So something like Willowbrook, you know, this horrible institution in New York State um, from which a bunch of Camp Genetian uh, campers uh, came and, and which Jim remembers kind of being haunted by having seen Geraldo Rivera's expose about it in the 70s. You know, how could we put that in there without it kind of ruining the feeling that we had, were um, painstakingly creating, which was allowing people to come into Camp Jeanette and not ever feel any of those feelings that people are almost uniquely used to feeling when they see disability represented in the media, you know? And so we had a couple of ways of working on it. One was something called the spirit of Steve, which was this sort of punk attitude of Steve Hoffman, one of the characters in the film. And we just asked ourselves, does every scene have that kind of punk, like sort of F, -E -F you, you know, um, I'm gonna be the way I am kind of attitude. That was one 
one thing. And the other thing was just like really layering a, a complexity of emotion in every scene, you know, not allowing any scene to be kind of one pure emotion. Because if you did that, sure enough, we would have test screenings and we would see audiences kind of slipping into that way of seeing disability. Fascinating. And by the way, Steve is the other source of the R rating here, and I'll leave you with that tantalizing uh, little teaser. Uh, fascinating character, just a wonderful, wonderful protagonist among many in this film. I want to at least get to, I, we're, we're coming against time here, but I want to get to an audience question. This is from Rena Strober of California, and this is for Jim. Um, Jim, who makes his, who's, who's become like, as we have said, a really accomplished sound designer, especially in the theater. She asks, how can theater specifically become more inclusive of those with disabilities? Oh, that's a really wonderful question. I, look, I think that we've seen non-traditional casting happen in the past um, um, where, um, uh, and I think this needs to be extended towards actors with disabilities, but also the infrastructure needs to change. Wouldn't it be great if this trillion, two, three trillion dollar uh, package that uh, President Biden is uh, pushing forward now included some money to renovate theaters so people with disabilities can easily be on stage and work behind the set, uh, behind, uh, in backstage also. I mean, uh, w th there are people with disabilities who are uh, capable and able to work in the entertainment business, but we're being held back by stigma and um, and lack of access. And, you know, you'll see more authentic films and theater projects like Crip Camp if um, our industries really uh, embraced us and applied the same diversity and inclusion efforts that they have for other people. Well, you know, and that gets to something that, that really s struck home with me watching it, which is that, you know, most of this is the largest, I don't want to even use the word minority group, but this is the largest group in the country. Um, and we're all, most of us are going to be a member of that group in some fashion in terms of natural limitations. Um, and so as we've seen with the Americans with Disabilities Act, those reforms helped us all. And we're grateful for those every day. Um, so Nicole, but, specifically, oh, go ahead, Jim. But don't frame it as limitations. It is a natural right. progression in life. And exactly. my gosh, so many of us think that this is our special power. You know, I, I have to improvise almost every day and I'm not the only one. All of us do. So, uh, so you know, let's frame it not as this medical decline, but this evolution of who we are as people. And it, and it can be a beautiful thing and an enlightening thing for so many people. Very well said. And, and the fact that this did come out in pandemic year, Nicole, where, where accessibility in many ways through things like Zoom, like what we're doing today, you know, it has opened up accessibilities to, uh, to some programs to more people. So I don't know, Nicole, can you speak to that briefly before we have to say goodbye? But um, do you think people's consciousnesses have been lifted a little bit over the last year? Yeah, I do. And I'm happy that Crip Camp has been able to be kind of a part of that cultural conversation. I think that, um, you know, uh, people with disabilities have seen suddenly things that that people, folks have been being told for years where it wasn't possible for a class, a college class, for example, or a meeting or working from home, you know, to be to to be done. And all of a sudden, because of the pandemic and everybody needs it, it's possible. And I think that the hope is that there's been um, enough learning about the importance of accessibility that those things won't be taken away, you know, as vaccinations ramp up and, and things get back to quote unquote normal, you know, but that we will have realized the importance of making these kinds of accommodations around accessibility in order for our workplaces, our communities, et cetera, to be truly inclusive. And, um, and actually our impact uh, producer, Andrea Levant, and, um, and Stacey Park Milburn, two brilliant um, young disabled activists out of the disability justice movement, created a virtual Crip Camp experience um, at the very beginning of the pandemic that 10,000 people from all over the world joined in. It was a weekly summer camp all summer for 16 Sundays um, that really did have a lot of the elements of the community of Camp Jeanette and, um, and actually built capacity for the disability rights movement in the middle of the pandemic and now is being kind of lauded as an example of how you can make a virtual envir environment really inclusive. So um, it is an exciting conversation and I just hope we don't forget the, the learnings that we 
um, had this this year. Indeed. Well, that's a, a an optimistic note to end on. I want to thank both of you so very much for joining us today and for for helping introduce our audience to Crip Camp. Thank Great you. To talk to you.